Good morning. Thank you very much for being here today. My name is Patrick Thronson, and I work at the law firm of Jan and Janet and Suggs. With John Spragans, whom you will hear from shortly, I'm exceptionally proud to represent our client who has sued the Diocese of Knoxville in Bishop Sticka. I'm sure many of you are aware of the allegations in the lawsuit, but briefly, what we allege and expect the evidence will show at trial, among many things, is that our client, who was an employee of the diocese, was raped by a former seminarian, Wojciech Subchuk, who lived at one point with Bishop Sticka. And as we allege, there's a handwritten apology letter from Subchuk to our client regarding the rape that is reproduced in the complaints we filed in this case. We expect the evidence will show that Bishop Sticka and the diocese knew or should have known that Sobchuk because was a danger to others, including our client, before he raped our client. And we expect the evidence will show that Bishop Sticka knowingly interfered with the investigation into the assault. We expect a jury will find that Bishop Sticka defamed our client. In tape recorded statements we have by saying that our client not Sobchuk had perpetrated this criminal act. That allegation is completely and utterly false. We expect the evidence will show that Bishop Sticka repeatedly harmed our client's reputation and caused him great emotional harm by saying that he had committed this ser serious felony. Can you imagine being the victim of a serious crime and having, as we allege, a nationally prominent, powerful person in the community say that you, not the alleged perpetrator, committed the offense. In brief, that's what our case is about. The resignation of Bishop Sticka is an important development that has global significance. It's not every day that a bishop resigns as a result in significant part of allegations of administrative misconduct and defamation associated with sexual abuse. It's also a first step in justice and accountability. We are seeking full justice for our client, meaning just compensation and an apology. His case continues. And we believe substantial reform is needed to help many other survivors who deserve full justice as well. John and Susan and David will be talking more about that shortly. Our first thanks goes to our client. We would not be here without the incredible courage and determination of our client. We are incredibly proud to represent him. Coming forward is a difficult process for any survivor, and the way that the diocese and Bishop Sticka have conducted themselves has made this process not just difficult, but terrifying. Bishop Sticka, as we allege, not only repeatedly defamed our client, but he and the diocese opposed, opposed, our client's efforts to sue under a pseudonym, even though doing so would not have impacted in any way their ability to defend the lawsuit. Unfortunately, the judge sided with them on this issue, but our client persisted and filed suit under his own name. We beat back multiple efforts to hide and keep important documents secret. We are confidently continuing to pursue our case and seeking to uncover the whole truth about what happened. I also want to thank Susan Vance, SNAP, David Wells, and the Survivors Network. I have never met someone quite like Susan. We all owe her and the advocates who work alongside her an enormous debt of gratitude. I also want to thank those priests in the diocese and other personnel who put their careers and reputations on the line to get the truth out. You know who you are, you have acted with courage, and we are grateful to you. With the courage of our client and many others, something of global significance has happened in the smallest diocese in America. We hope that new leadership in the Diocese of Knoxville can be a model for how survivors are treated with fairness, dignity, and respect, rather than, as has unfortunately been the case, the opposite. And this is just the beginning. Thank you all very much again. And now I'd like to uh, turn the time over to John Spragans. Patrick. My name's John Spragans. I'm an attorney in Nashville with Spragans Law. You know, I was reflecting on this because 20 years ago, 
I was a journalist, just like the journalist in this room. And I was covering sexual abuse cases in Nashville, including cases involving sexual abuse of children by Catholic priests, other religious leaders, camp counselors, and other people in positions of authority. 20 years ago, Susan Vance was there standing outside the Diocese of Nashville, demanding accountability, just as she has continued to do uh, in East Tennessee. In the last two decades, we've seen a lot of progress. We've seen investigations in other parts of the country that have documented a history of sexual abuse and too often systematic attempts to cover it up and to silence abuse survivors and their advocates. Today, we mark an important milestone in that progress with the resignation of Bishop Sticka after an investigation by the Vatican. I want to echo Patrick in thanking brave survivors of sexual abuse like John Doe and Jane Doe without their incredible courage to hold their perpetrators accountable and to demand accountability from the diocese and church leadership all the way up to the Vatican. Sexual abusers and those who cover up sexual misconduct would continue to get away with it. Bishop Sticka's resignation represents an important step toward accountability. I also want to acknowledge the decades of work done by advocates for abuse survivors, <laughs> helping these men and women confront their abusers and hold the church accountable for covering up and enabling sexual abuse. This work by members of the community to demand justice is heartfelt and it is personal. It has changed many lives and it has made it possible for our client, John Doe, to have the strength to come forward and confront uh, his abuser and those who have enabled his abuse. There's more work to be done though. Tennessee has passed a law that makes it a felony for priests or pastors to have sexual contact with members of their congregation. It's an abuse of a position of trust for a religious leader to have a sexual relationship with an adult in their congregation. And now the state of Tennessee and the church itself recognize that abuse, sexual abuse can happen between a member of the clergy and an adult. That is what's happened in this situation. Um, the work that remains to be done, however, has to do with the statute of limitations in Tennessee. Survivors of sexual abuse, uh, the studies show, often do not know that they have been abused until later in life. In fact, after age 50, typically, when through painful processes in their own life as they confront past trauma, they learn that they, in fact, were a victim of sexual abuse as a minor. In Tennessee, it's too late for people to get accountability through the civil justice system if they don't learn that until they're 40 or 45 or 50 or 55. And that's why Tennessee needs to join uh, an increasing number of states around the country, states and provinces, 20, uh, 27 the last time I counted, that have expanded the amount of time that you can bring a civil lawsuit to hold a sexual abuser accountable for your abuse that happened when you were a minor. Um, the federal government has completely done away with the statute of limitations for sexual abuse of minors. Uh, that's a bipartisan effort, and it should be a bipartisan effort in Tennessee as well. We should also have a window for survivors of sexual abuse who are confronting these past traumas that happened to them. Anybody who suffered from sexual abuse should be given a time period to come forward now and file a case in our civil justice system, because that's the way we demand accountability in this country. There's gonna be a broad coalition of groups uh, like SNAP and others who are gonna be demanding this change at the state legislature. There was a bill filed in the past session uh, to uh, prospectively undo the statute of limitations for child sex abuse. And we're gonna be calling for accountability based on examples like we're seeing here in East Tennessee. I wanna thank one more time uh, John Doe, our client, for his courageous efforts to hold the church accountable. And I thank the, the priests and members of the Catholic Church, including members of congregations in East Tennessee, who have been unwilling to let this slide and who have demanded real accountability from their leaders. Thank you. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dave Wells. <clears throat> My name is Dave Wells, and I am the former director of religious education at the Cathedral of Most Sacred Heart of Jesus here in Knoxville. I served in that role from 2013 to 2018. 
And during that time, I had the opportunity to get to know many of the priests of our diocese, and I have enormous respect for them, as well as for the religious sisters and many of the dedicated lay employees who work for the church. Our priests offer their lives as a living sacrifice in love and service to Christ and his church. And I am privileged to call many of them my friends. As this story unfolded, I went from a concerned observer to become a voice for the voiceless, many of the priests who could not speak up publicly. Many of them reached out to me privately or followed me on social media where I was posting these stories. In fact, it was in response to the posts that I was making on social media that Bishop Sticka started reaching out to me uh, and texting me and emailing me and calling me um, over time to dispute uh, many of these stories. Many friends have also privately messaged me and thanked me for my advocacy on behalf of our priests. I've also been able to support many of the journalists uh, throughout this process, and I'd like to especially recognize uh, J.D. Flynn from The Pillar, whose reporting has been invaluable, uh, as well as Christine Niles from Church Militant, Brian Fraga from National Catholic uh, Reporter, and locally here, Tyler Whetstone from uh, Knoxville News Sentinel, who uh, has, has been very helpful in getting this story to the people in the pews. Behind the scenes, I encouraged many concerned parishioners to write letters to church officials, uh, both locally uh, to the uh, Apostolic Nuncio in Washington, uh, as, as well as to the uh, Dicastery of Bishops in Rome. Behind the scenes, we were able to build a broad coalition from very traditional Catholics to very progressive Catholics, all of whom agreed on one thing, Sticka must go. We're here today because Rick Sticka is not. He was asked to resign by the Pope. Many Catholics may be wondering why has this come about. Ultimately, it is because he disobeyed the Pope. Not Pope Francis, but Peter, our first Pope. In his first letter, in the New Testament, St. Peter wrote, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder, tend the flock of Christ that is in your charge, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Rick Sticka did not care for the flock entrusted to him. He did not protect the sheep from the wolves. Rick Sticka did not provide a good example to his fellow elders, his priests. Rick Sticka pressured them and bullied them. Some priests have left the priesthood because of him. Many were barely hanging on, praying for a change. Some even prayed in the words of Psalm 108, that his days be few and another take his office. So now I ask former parishioners and associates and all my Catholic friends to show support for your priests. Talk to them, write them, let them know you care. Pray for the church. Many churches, not just the Catholic church, are dealing with issues around clergy sex abuse. Issues such as accountability for abusers and those in authority who enable them. Pray for wisdom and courage to face this issue and to bring about change. Above all, I ask you to pray for the victims. I know John Doe personally. I worked with him. I know he is a good man, and I know his story is credible. Pray that all victims of clergy sex abuse find healing and justice. Thank you. I am so very grateful to be last because you have heard from people who can speak far better than I can 
the words that need to be said. I'm going to speak about Jane Doe in just a moment because I uh, want you to know about her. First of all, let me just say that intimidation and retaliation have been the two words, the two hallmarks of the tenure of Bishop Richard Sticka in Knoxville. That is horrifying, but it was even more horrifying to be part and to be the subject of intimidation and retaliation. Bishop Sticka has told us he is resigning or retiring actually because of medical reasons. Let me just say this, he did not get a Hallmark greeting card from Pope Francis that said, hey Rick, you can go ahead and retire medically if you want, it's okay. Despite the fact that there have been two horrible investigations about you conducted by the Vatican, love Pope Francis. That did not happen. And the reason that we have this situation in Knoxville with Richard Sticka is that, as Dave has said, he basically, the Pope asked him to resign. And this, this has to be kept in mind going forward and finding out all the truth that we can. And truth will be found out to the last degree in this whole situation. We do have, as Dave said, people that have in the pews who have been lied to and the truth has been kept from them. And the priest certainly, as Dave has spoken so eloquently. But let me just say there were two investigations, one by the Archbishop of Louisville, who at the time was Joseph Kurtz. And Joseph Kurtz came to Knoxville totally hidden, spoke to people we do not know, made a report, sent it to Rome, we do not know what it said. Then in late November and early December of 2022, the Vatican sent what's called an apostolic visitation. When you hear the words apostolic visitation, you're in trouble. This is They're not coming to give you a trophy. And they came to investigate the tenure of Bishop Richard Sticka and also to investigate the diocese itself. Whatever they found out, along with Kurtz's report, went to Pope Francis, who said, on May 13th, it was reported in the pillar, Vatican to ask Bishop Sticka to resign. That was May 13th, a mere approximately six weeks ago. And yet, yet this week, we hear from Bishop Sticka that uh, he is retiring. I frankly think we need to investigate that more. Beside me here are two victims. Do you see them right here? No, you do not see them because they are silenced by Bishop Richard Sticka. Every single victim who has come to Sticka or filed a lawsuit since 2009 has had to sign an NDA, whether that be a non-disclosure agreement or a non-disparaging agreement or some other confidentiality statements in their settlements with the diocese, whether they be through the court or privately. Every single solitary victim has been silenced. That should raise huge red flags to every Catholic and every citizen of uh, East Tennessee. The um, important thing to note is that these victims, whom you do not see, have asked me to ask Bishop, Archbishop Fogg of Louisville to release them from these silencing agreements. Uh, right here is, um, I will send this out by certified mail this afternoon to the Archbishop. It is a request that these two victims who have personally asked me to do this should be released by him from the illegal NDAs under which they have been placed. In 2002, the Dallas Charter was developed by the bishops to try to tell people how they would, from now on, protect their children. Um, in that document, Article 3 says, no victim may be silenced unless that victim chooses silence. In 2019, the Pope wrote a very important document, which he verified again in 2023. It's called Vos Estes Lux Mundi. And in that document, it states again, no victim or whistleblower can be uh, silenced and no, no one must in any way interfere with their speech. Bishop Sika has done this routinely, consistently, deliberately 
for the 14 years he has been here. So we're going to ask Archbishop Bob to change that. He is now the leader of the Diocese of Knoxville. This is a chance to undo a huge wrong that has been done to victims of clergy abuse. The first person not to have to be silenced was Celeste Arnone in uh, 20, 2021 when her case was settled. Bishop Sticka did not like it, but she was not silenced. She would be here today except for family reasons. Michael Boyd in 2019 was silenced with a non-disparaging clause. And I asked the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops in five separate complaints to relieve him from this illegal NDA. They don't even respond. If you're a lay person, they don't care. They will not answer you. They think you're going to go away. <clears throat> I'm standing here today to tell you we are going nowhere. And we are not stopping until we get justice for these victims, until the people who want to speak will be able to speak and speak freely. They want to tell you their stories. They want you to understand what they endured from Bishop Richard Sticker. I just want to say a few things. What has been said about John Doe, absolutely ditto, ditto, ditto. A heroic man, as is Michael Boyd, Celeste Arnon and Jane Doe. Jane Doe came to this country as an asylum-seeking Honduran mother whose um, husband had been killed. She sought asylum here. The church, it's almost impossible. It would take all day to tell you what they have done or tried to do to her to intimidate her and retaliate against her. They even got records illegally from uh, her workplace and tried to get the police to deport her. These kind of actions were sanctioned by Bishop Ritzica. The buck stopped with him and he had to have sanctioned all this going on. There is no doubt about it. And to intimidate this woman, as well as John Doe and Celeste Arnone, Michael Boyd, the intimidation was wrong and it, uh, someday, when everybody can tell their stories, you will see what we're talking about. Jane Doe in Gatlinburg needs our support. She needs for us to know that we, and I tried to tell her in SNAP, we are with her and we will stay with her as we do with all of our victims. I think I want to say one more thing. I did not know until this last weekend that Bishop Richard Sticka was a victim of sexual abuse, as he's told many of your stations, when he was 13, a freshman in high school. I just found that out. And I've been here 14 years with him. I sincerely want to say this. I wish with all my heart that I had been told that he had confided in me about that. I would have been to him what I tried to be to all victims, and that is a supporting ear, a help in any way I can be. But instead of being able to help him, we have been on a contentious course this whole 14 years. It didn't have to be that way. He did not have to side with the uh, rapist in the John Doe case. He did not have to send uh, officials up to Gatlinburg to try to undermine everything about uh, Jane Doe, but he did. This is something that cannot be ignored. I want him to know at this very minute, we can talk, Bishop. I can help you with resources. I can at least be a listening ear that I could not be for 14 years. Um, you will be in my prayers. I will be working with other victims, keeping you very close in mind and very close in my heart. That's really all we have to say. I'm going to turn this over to Patrick Bronson for questions from any of you, if that's okay. Much, Susan. Any questions? Does the bishop resignation have any sort of impact on the lawsuit? Can you just address? I, every, I understand it's going to continue. Does that mean anything? Does that change anything for John Doe? It doesn't have any particular, I guess, legal significance in the case. I mean, the case will still continue to go forward. Um, I mean, certainly it's a, uh, it's a damning piece of evidence, um, but uh, with respect to 
you know, any particular effect on the legal proceeding, there's not a, there's not a definite one. I mean, the case will continue to go forward against both him and the diocese. Would you be able to talk a little bit more about the statute of limitations and the work that's going to be done to kind of like correct that here at Tennessee? Sure. I'll, I think I'd ask uh, John Sprague to address that. There is a national advocacy group called ChildUSA.org that has, um, I would encourage you to look at their website for resources about the state of statutes of limitation with respect to um, civil justice for sex abuse across the country. Um, in Tennessee, a coalition began to form during this last legislative session um, to try to push uh, the legislature to repeal the statute of limitations going forward. Um, so anyone who is sexually abused in Tennessee, uh, what the original bill said as of July 1st, 2023, which is Saturday, um, would uh, have uh, the opportunity to sue at any time that they realize that. Um, I think it should be broader. I, there's a, I think you'll find broad support in this coalition um, to enable survivors of sexual abuse even if it happened 20 or 30 years ago, to bring those claims now, um, which is something that you've seen happen in various states across the country, uh, New York, Vermont, uh, there's a whole list of them. So um, even Kentucky has moved further down this road than Tennessee has. So it's time for Tennessee, and I say that as someone who's born in Kentucky, um, it is time for Tennessee to catch up with the other states um, and try to provide justice for sexual abuse survivors. This is something that has been extremely bipartisan on the federal level, and I have every hope that it'll be bipartisan in Tennessee as well. Thank you. 